Well, it's good to see you all again. If I can get this microphone back on. There'll be a day where we don't have to wear these things. Microphones or masks in heaven. But. So a couple of announcements before we get into the sermon. This is Holy Week. We just had our Palm Sunday part of our celebration. A couple of things coming up later this week. On Good Friday at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a service that'll be both in person and online. So you're welcome to join us for a Good Friday service. There'll be some singing a meditation on the cross, and both on Good Friday and Easter, we're going to look at Jesus' fearlessness, which is very different than what we normally expect fearlessness to look like. Then Easter Sunday, we're going to have a normal service. Um, Easter is like the Super Bowl of the church. And I almost forgot to mention, though, Saturday at uh, between 11 and noon, we're having a drive-by Easter egg hunt. There's not much hunting to it. You just show up and they give you stuff. That's my sort of hunting. It's like there's an old King of the Hill episode where they go and they're hunting and there's just a corn dispenser. I'm like, okay, there, there's a deer, go ahead and shoot it. That's kind of what the, sort of a hunt this is. But it'll still be good. Invite your friends and family. It's a good way to let people remember that, yeah, in the middle of the pandemic, the church is still there. Um, Jesus is always open for business. So just a great way to begin inviting people. But Easter is always a wonderful ser- service. So looking forward to celebrating Easter with you. Today we're going to be continuing in First Peter. So if you have a Bible or an app that you use to read the Bible, if not, it's in the bulletin for you. We're in 1 Peter 3, looking just at a few verses, verses 13 to to, to 16. 13 to 11 would be really tricky to read backwards. So um, let's pray that God helps us understand. Heavenly Father, pray that you would open your word to us. Lord, I'm so aware of how easy it is for my words to be wrong at times, but your word is true. So, Lord, teach us your ways. Lord, open our hearts and give us courage to follow through on what you're teaching us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is what Peter writes. Um, He's writing to a bunch of people in what's now modern-day Turkey, and they're beginning to be oppressed. So being a Christian is risky. And he says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you or your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. That's God's word. And what Peter is saying is people will see your good deeds. And earlier he said some people see your good deeds and they'll praise God. And others will see your good deeds and they still might persecute you. And what we're going to talk about today is how it's sometimes fearful to be a Christian. Sometimes even the best Christians make mistakes. And sometimes even when we're not making mistakes, the world hates what we're saying. And we're in a world that is more and more aligned against what the church has stood for for thousands of years. And there could be a time when being a Christian is risky. And I heard of a story happened in 1999 of a guy who grew up in Australia named Graham. His last name is Staines, so he's Graham Staines. He was an Australian-born person who felt the call to India and began to work in a small village that was in abject poverty working in their leper community. And at a big Christian conference, he went with his two sons. He had a wife, a daughter, two young boys who were 9 and 11 at the time. And him and his two sons were staying in their um, van or station wagon during the night. And a mob of Muslim radical or Hindu radicals surrounded them, wouldn't let them out, doused their car in in gasoline and lit it on fire. And when they found their bodies... The dad had his two sons protecting them as best he could. And I share this because this was not long ago in India. This is a place where people were, were doing good. They were caring for the poor. They were with the people who were, were the most impoverished. Dealing with lepers who even in their caste system were the lowest of the low. They were acclaimed for their good deeds and yet they suffered. And so when Peter says, who will persecute you? Who will who will hurt you if you're eager to do good deeds? It's not a rhetorical question because the answer is there could be somebody. And so what I want to talk about today is how do we deal with that fear? That fear that people may turn against us, maybe in brutal ways. 
How do we be a witness? And how do we make sure our witness endures? So first, let's talk about fear. And honestly, there's wonderful books written on this. Paul Tripp has a book called Running Scared that I would highly recommend. But what Peter says is, who's going to harm you? But even if you do suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Going right back to the Beatitudes, the last Beatitude is, blessed are you when you are persecuted, as Jesus said. And then there's a quote, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. And what Peter does here is there's a negative and a positive. Negatively, he says, don't be afraid. But positively, you can't just empty your heart of fear. Where the fear was, put in a reverence for Christ. But let's look at the negative first. Negatively, it says, do not fear their threats. And honestly, fear is one of those things that your mind is saying something's wrong. Um, I'm not going to do a poll if anybody has phobias, but there's, I, by God's grace, don't have any, of, though I'm just afraid of everything. So, what is Charlie Brown says, he is... Um, phobia of pho- uh, panophobia is afraid of just everything. Um, when we're afraid, it's your bo- mind saying there's something wrong. There's this vivid memory I have from when I was about six or seven. I had a dream that there was this vampire in a tuxedo that was chasing me. It was a really well dressed vampire. And when I woke up, the way my house was situated, I was in a little twin bed, and there was the hallway that went right down the stairs, and on the stairwell, was a beam of light that looked like the white tuxedo shirt that the, tux- that the vampire was wearing. And I woke up, and I had two huge things going on in my mind. There was a vampire, and I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the vampire was between me and the bathroom. Now, I was sick, so I'm not going to wet the bed, but vampires are scary. And it took a while for my brain to slowly realize that, wait, there's no such thing as having to go to the bathroom. I mean, there's no such thing. <laughs> there's no such thing as vampires, but just been watching too many. I think there was a very scary episode of Fantasy Island that night or something. I don't know. Sometimes that's Ricardo Montalban can be creepy. But um, so finally, it took a while for my brain to realize, okay, there's nothing to actually fear here, and I could go on with my lives. My lives, my life. Um, <laughs> you see, I, sometimes I get my words mixed up. The Bible is the only one that you can really trust. But there are things that we should be afraid of, like snakes. There are studies that say that your body will react to seeing a snake before you can process the thought snake. Because, you know, a long time ago when you're walking through the woods, if you see a snake before you can think, oh, that happens to be a snake. How interesting. I think I will move out of its way. You're already bitten and you're dead. And so people would automatically just flinch when they see snakes. Even Indiana Jones, if it's a snake, it had to be a snake, right? Right? And so we're triggered that way. I guess Charles Darwin supposedly had a king cobra in the place where he worked. And every day he would go down there and put his face by the glass and try not to flinch. And he was never able to stop flinching when the cobra would rear up at him. It's just ingrained deeply. And so when you see a snake, okay, there's actually something to be afraid there. But then you can do some reasoning. Wait, is that a king cobra or is that a gardener snake? And you can begin to calm yourself down. And so a lot of things that we have to do in life is we see what's scary, and then we test it. And is this actually scary? Is this a king cobra, or is this a beam of light that looks like a vampire type level? And so what we do in the Bible is we say, okay, what are the threats against us, and then what's reality? And the threats against us are things that can kill our bodies, that can hurt us socially and physically. But the true reality is that our social standing and our physical bodies don't define us. And so what Jesus said in Matthew Matthew 10 is he says, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. And that's an odd way to say, don't be afraid if they only kill your body. But he continues, but they can't kill your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And we'll talk about healthy fear in just a moment, but what he's saying is the worst they can do is kill you, but that doesn't change how God loves you. It doesn't change your eternal destiny doesn't change how you feel. And even if they don't kill you, but they try to attack you, you can still be inside a whole and complete person. And I'm not saying that's easy. What Grand Stains went through is a horrific way to die. People who have been bullied because of their faith or, or however they've been persecuted, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it is. But when you step back away from that hard situation, you can say, okay, every kid at school hates me. But does anybody still love me? And yeah, God does. My body is not what it used to be because of what they did or maybe just because of age or maybe just because I've been serving for so long that everything feels broken down. Is that my ultimate status? And God would say no. 
because in my sight you're whole. And so when Jesus said that, he was sending his disciples on their first missionary journey. He's sending them out to tell them about the kingdom of God. And don't be afraid because they can't kill what's really important about you. They can't take away the fact that I love you. And Peter has a very similar argument just before this, what we studied last week. Peter quotes an old psalm that says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayers. And so don't be afraid if they try to hurt you. Because God still sees you, and God still loves you. And then once you have that, then you have the courage to act. And overcoming fear mentally is one thing, but then taking action is really hard. When I first started playing rugby, it's scary to tackle somebody. And honestly, I'd rather get tackled than tackle somebody. Getting tackled is easy. You don't have to do anything. They do all the work. The ground does the other half. But tackling somebody, you have to line up, and then all the weight is right on your shoulder. When you get tackled, it's around the hips and legs. But when you tackle somebody, it's like head and shoulder. That's why I've gotten hurt more tackling than being tackled. And what our team captain said is, within the first five minutes, make a big hit. And the reason for that is, once you make that big hit, then you're like, oh, that's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But honestly, it's been a year to a month since I've played. If I had to go tackle Vince right now, I'd be a little scared for a lot of reasons. Um, but, but also just the pain level, and he's a very well-armed and well-trained person who can take out cows with a glance. I wouldn't stand a chance. So, <laughs> But that's the negative side is don't be afraid. Put the fear out. But then the next thing he says is positively set your hearts on Christ. Revere Christ in your heart. So it says if you put Christ, the word revere means to dedicate, to make holy. And to understand this, we have to hyperlink back to Isaiah. See up there what Peter quotes You see those little quotes, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. Now, if you're like me, you're wondering, well, what's he quoting? It doesn't jump out immediately. But if you're Peter, if you were somebody who was a Jewish person or lived in that culture back then, that would immediately trigger your mind, almost like you're clicking on a hyperlink, taking you somewhere else in the book, back to Isaiah chapter 8, where the prophet Isaiah says something very similar where he says, Do not call conspiracy everything their people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. When they translated Isaiah into Greek, they call that the Septuagint. What Peter's quoting is exactly from the the Greek version of the Hebrew. So what he's saying is, Isaiah's writing about a time in Jerusalem's life when they were afraid, when they were being threatened. Back then, um, Jerusalem and Israel had separated. Judah was the closer to God kingdom, Israel was lining up with Syria and they were going to attack them and take them out. And so the people up in Judah were afraid and God says through Isaiah, don't worry about their conspiracies, don't worry about their threats, don't be afraid. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And so Peter says, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. He quotes Isaiah where God, where Isaiah is putting the word Yahweh, Lord Almighty, Jesus puts, Peter puts Jesus' name there. That's kind of a big deal. And then says, put a love and fear for God, for Jesus in your heart where the fear used to be. Now this isn't, I don't think, a call to say, oh, it's Jesus, he's going to smite me down. Just as it wasn't in Israel's day, in Isaiah's day, I'd say always be trembling and terrified of God the way you would be in front of a king cobra, where you put your face in front of God and try not to flinch, he's that scary. What he's saying is, help God's perspective see the reality of life as it really is. Because when we're afraid, we think a shadow of light is a vampire. We see a snake, and immediately we think poisonous. And we see a person, we see threat. But if you can step back and see reality as it really is, that's just a beam of light. That's just a garden snake. And that person who seems like such a threat is nothing compared to God. God is forever. This person is fleeting. God holds my life, my eternity in his hands. This person just stopped loving me, and it hurts. And I wish we could stop it, wish we could change it. But it doesn't minimize who God is. And when we do this, he becomes our sanctuary. In times of fear, God becomes a sanctuary that no one can take away. The next line in Isaiah is he will be a holy place. And by holy place, it means sanctuary or refuge for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will become a trap and a snare. So that holy place, that sanctuary, 
is a place where nothing can get you. So I think what Isaiah and what Peter is referring to is everything around there is terrible and awful. Imagine a huge storm with hail and rocks and, and lightning, but you've got a safe place. And you're not afraid in the place. You'd be afraid to leave the place. And so when Peter and when Isaiah is calling us to fear the Lord and he'll become a sanctuary, what they're saying is the best and safest place to be is close to the middle of God's heart. And the scariest place to be is to be leaving that place. So stay close to God, fear him, stay close to him, and he'll protect you. But when you leave that place, that's when things start getting scary. And I think that's the point. When it says, push fear away, but in your heart, revere Christ as Lord, and he becomes that sanctuary, that place, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, I'm going to make it through this. And this is our whole identity. The whole argument of Peter is that because of God, we're safe. You notice how in Isaiah, you may have heard that phrase before, a stone to make men stumble, a rock that makes men fall. We studied that just a few weeks ago because Peter's already talked about it. In the big argument of our identity in chapter two, Peter says that Jesus was rejected. He was the cornerstone that the builders rejected. And now he will be stumbling over it. But because of that, he saves us so that we can become living stones, a chosen people, a royal nation a people belonging to God. And that's your identity. No matter what the world throws, no matter what they say, that's your identity. Now, it's very easy to have this academically, but it's really hard when things are really scary out there. Remember times growing up, I was just by nature a geeky kid, and the fact that I was a Christian didn't help my social standing. I remember in sixth grade, one kid was wanting to fight me, and he was trying to get me to throw the first punch, and I just wasn't going to fight. I got into a lot of fights, but I never would throw a first punch. I would just try to stand up for what I thought was right. And that phrase, just turn the other cheek, just came to mind. So the guy just slams me, and I just like stood there. And you know what happens when you're in sixth grade and you turn the other cheek? They punch the other cheek. <laughs> and so I end up in the mud, beaten up, just feeling like a total loser, and I go to the school nurse, who happens to be my mom, <laughs> which doesn't really help the cool factor. <laughs> and when you're that age, that's everything, isn't it? That kid beat me up. None of the girls like me. Everybody hates me. At least I have my Atari. I mean, that was all you got going for you. But then when you can step back and see who are you really, are you defined by the fact that some kid beat you up and threw you in the mud? Are you defined by the fact that you're not social, that you're not on the team, that whatever? Or is there something deeper that defines you? And as a kid, honestly, I didn't know it well enough. I didn't get it. It took a long time to work it out, and there's places I still work it out. But when we see that, it doesn't say, okay, that doesn't hurt because God's your refuge. What you say is, that hurts. We talked about this last week. I'm empathetic. I'm sympathetic. I'm in this with you. But let me remind you what really matters. You're not defined by them. You're defined by God. You're his chosen one. You're his holy one. You belong to him. And that's our real reality. And what we have, once we have that, is the ability to tell others about it, to be a witness. The first passage in the Bible I ever met, memorized was this one, where it says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect. And the word there, when it says to give an answer, the word there is the word where we get apologize from, apologia, which just means to give an answer. And there's a whole study of Christianity called apologetics. And I wish I could just spend hours giving you tips and pointers on apologetics. I've done that in other scenarios, and maybe someday we'll do a series or a class on it. But the point is, have your hope and know how to tell people about it. And your hope is that no matter what happens now, my future is with Christ. So no matter what happened to Graham Staines and his two sons, they're in heaven now. And there's no more tears, there's no more hate, there's no more burning, there's no more leprosy. No matter how unsocial you feel or how beat up you feel, in the future there's peace, there's wholeness, there's an understanding. And so the hope that you have is that this world right now is not all that matters, that there's a God who loves me, and have to know how to tell people about it. And Peter's logic in here is just mind-blowing. Even as I was revisiting at that this week, just reminding myself how Peter argues it, you might think, well, why is he talking about apologetics in the middle of this thing about suffering? 
And the truth is, if you have faith instead of fear, then you can actually turn toward people because faith opens us up to relationships. If you're afraid of everybody, then why are you going to tell them anything, especially something so personal, something so vulnerable as the fact that you follow Jesus? If your relationships are marked by that sort of fear, you're just going to keep your mouth shut. But if your fear is put in the right place and you actually revere God instead of fearing them, then your hope can actually bubble to the service so you can find ways to say it. There's an old commentator, Leonhard Goblet, which you just tell, not Goblet, but someone who speaks French can pronounce that for me later. Um, but just with a name like that, you know he's got to be smart. And he says, faith does not close doors to relationships with other people out of fear or hate. It turns rather in openness to others just as it turns to God. And so if I'm living in fear, I'm going to hate you, I'm going to shut you out, I'm going to protect myself. But in faith, I can turn toward God, and by turning toward God, I, I immediately start turning toward other people. And when you start turning toward other people is when you have a chance to be a witness. Gladys, um, the wife of Nicholas, of Graham, sorry, was left alone with her daughter. And they asked her to write an article that they were going to put in every paper in India. About a billion people would have access to read it. And what she wrote is, I only have one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter, neither am I angry. But I have a great desire for every citizen of this country to establish their own relationship with Jesus Christ, who gave his life for, our, for their sin. Let us burn hatred and spread the flame of Christ's love. So I'm not leaving. I'm not going to go back to Australia. I'm going to raise my daughter here. I'm going to stay in the same country with the same tribe. I'm going to keep caring for the lepers. And she stayed there for 15 more years with her daughter and became the second best known Christian in India next to Mother Teresa. She said that I feel sad I didn't get to see my sons growing up. And even though Christ is my companion, I miss my husband. But God gives me support and the prayers of others give me support. And Jesus is the sword of every, source of every consolation and support. I forgive others because I have first received forgiveness from Jesus Christ. I have encountered the presence of Jesus in my life and in this spirit I share. When we forgive, there's no bitterness in us. And so she worked with a lot of widows who've often also left, lost husbands, people who've lost kids. And in her brokenness and her compassion, she's become such a great witness that she's changed the lives of millions in India. Because the fear was gone, she could turn toward God and toward others and be a witness. And so when we deal with our own fears, then we can begin to give an answer. We can do apologetics. And while I said there's lots I could say, there's three things I do want to say about apologetics. And the first one is to have a plan. And the plan isn't, okay, I'm going to be on the 815 bus, I'm going to share the faith with three people. I used to go to a church in Indiana, and they gave us homework, actually. You have to share the gospel with five people this week. And just ridiculous. One, that's not how God works. And also, when you start trying to do that, you find out that half the people you talk to, especially in the Midwest, are actually Christians. So it was encouraging to talk to a lot of Christians, but it felt very judgmental and harsh. But the plan, I'm stealing this from a guy named Greg Kokel, who wrote a book called Tactics. He said, our goal is to be a gardener, not a harvester. When we think about evangelism, we think about the people who do the harvesting, like Billy Graham's, like, I'm going to say a prayer. If you feel led by the Lord, come forward. Or the people, you've heard stories like, got into the cab ride by the time we were to the airport, they were a Christian. That's never happened to me. That doesn't happen to most people. That's harvesting, and God gives some people those gifts, but most of us are just gardeners. And what a gardener does is they spend every day diligently working so that someday there might be something growing. Erica spent, what, four hours or so yesterday weeding our backyard, and someday we'll have strawberries. <laughs> she didn't get strawberries yesterday. She didn't go to the strawberry bush and say, I call you in the name of the Lord. <laughs> but I think that's how we view evangelism. I'm going to meet that person, I'm going to tell them about Jesus, and by the time the conversation's over, I'm going to give them my Bible, my phone number, and their life has changed forever. No, instead, all we do is just give them a nudge. Greg Kokel calls it putting a stone in their shoe. Just something to think about that wasn't there before. Maybe a little doubt in their own atheism, a little doubt in their own skepticism, a little hope that maybe God can help them through this. 
You might not change their life then, but you could change their life, especially God is working all everywhere through his whole church, the whole world. So you might say one little thing, and then they see a TV show, then they see a commercial, and the next thing you know, they're at a church, and they don't know why, and they realize that you were one little step that got them closer to Christ. So that's your plan. Your plan is just, can I just give them a shove? Just help them get a little bit closer to God. And then the next thing you know is information. To get, you need to know some information. If you have to give a reason for the hope that you have, then do you have a reason for the hope that you have? Could you explain what the gospel is? And I'm not saying can you read Burkhoff's systematic theology and repeat it faithfully. But could you say, you know what, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. Here's an example. And Jesus died on the cross to forgive my sins. And I don't have to live in shame and guilt. It can be that easy. But the problem is that, especially with media out there, there's so many people who are so good at picking apart Christianity. And they don't deal with real Christianity, but they can take the stereotypes of it, and they begin to help people lose their faith. So the lady on the screen is named Alyssa Childers. She used to be in a band called Zoe Girl. That was big back in the 90s and early 2000s. It was this Christian girl rock band. And she was touring. She grew up in L.A., was doing ministry in Skid Row. So she saw Christians helping real people. And she was touring. She had strong faith. And then after the band dissolved, everyone started getting married and having kids. She went to a church, and the pastor there, she just loved this guy. Great communicator, amazingly caring person. They started talking, and he said, you know, let me tell you something. I don't refer to myself as a Christian. This is her pastor. I'm what you'd call a hopeful agnostic. And I hear you say all these things about Jesus Christ, and he began to slowly pick her faith apart. You say that Jesus dies on the cross, but doesn't that sound like, like child abuse, that God would send his son to die on the cross? I mean, God tells us to forgive each other without killing anybody. Why can't God do that? I sent the video out a few weeks ago that deals with that specific one, but things like that she didn't have answers to. And this was her pastor, someone she respected, using the pulpit, using the whole way of the church, and slowly picked her faith apart until she had nothing left. And she was in this big storm of doubt, wondering if God was even there. So she finally, like, God, if you're there, would you send me a lifeboat? And someone gave her a book on apologetics, and she began to study and read, and she slowly rebuilt her faith. And now she spends her life, um, she's got a great podcast, written some books, to deal with the things that helped kill her faith in the first time and, and forewarn people. And honestly, this is why I send so many links in my Wednesday words and emails. I don't expect you guys to read all of them. It'd be great if you did. I'll give you a gold star. But just to give you some reference, this is why when we talked about slavery, I made sure to go through such big terms because that's what people say. Oh, you believe in God. Yeah. Well, God in the Bible loves slavery, doesn't he? How do you answer that? So I spent almost a whole sermon just saying, this is what slavery really was. This is what the Bible said about it. This is how God with the year of Jubilee and other principles, was working to subvert the culture of slavery so that we can have answers, so that someday someone can say, well, you believe this. You might not remember it all immediately. You might not be able to say it. Honestly, I can't sometimes. That's why God created Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo. You can go look this stuff up. But at least you'll know in your heart, yeah, I've heard something about that. I've heard that explained. So even though I can't say it perfectly right now, my faith is going to be okay. And then hopefully, we can maybe help some others along the way. But we have to know what we believe. Our faith isn't just intellectual, but if all it is is emotionalism and your family background, then it just takes a couple questions. Go to public university, make some friends outside the church, and you'll hear those questions. And so I want you guys to be forewarned, to be armed for that, because this is important stuff. And then the last thing we need is courage. And the main courage we need is both to get out there and even just to ask questions. In Greg Kogel's book, and I would love to talk more about this, he uses the topic of Columbo. Did anybody see the show? Um, Columbo just seems like this doddering guy. He's observing. And then when everything's over and the bad guy is all smug, like he gets away, Columbo's like, wait a second, something's bothering me. Mind if I ask you a question? And then it starts. And you might feel that way if someone's like making the best argument against Christianity, saying, oh, there's no way science in the Bible and the seven-day creation, and they're just going on. 
and you're listening and you're waiting, you're like, hold on, let me just ask you a question. And in the book, Tactics, these are the questions they recommend. Mind if I ask you a question? Just start. And they say, no, I don't want you asking me a question. I'm like, okay, then God isn't preparing this guy right now. I'm not going to kick him in the face like, listen to Jesus. I'm like, okay, I guess we're done. But the next question is, let's, can I ask you a question? Can we gain some information about this? What do you actually mean? What do you mean by that? Well, you Christians are so intolerant because you, th- you all think you're right. Well, I know what intolerance means, but ask them, well, what do you mean by intolerant? Well, by intolerant, I mean that you guys think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Well, how'd you come to that conclusion? Why do you think that I'm right and everybody else is wrong? And by the way, do you think that you're right? That I'm intolerant? Because then it sounds like maybe, why are you calling me intolerant? Or one thing Greg Kokel does is like they'll be talking about how all religions aren't the same, and they'll start calling him bigoted and intolerant. He goes, how did the conversation go from religions to my character and my personality? That's fine. I'll admit it. I'm, I'm bigoted and intolerant, and I'm a hateful person. But can we now get back to the subject? The subject isn't how mean is Greg. The question is, are all religions the same? And so just ask those questions. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? And then if you can, could I suggest an alternative? Here's maybe another way to say it. And again, you're not going to convince them all the way. But just asking those questions. Worst case, you've learned more about Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or, or whatever the person you're talking to believes. You've learned more about them, and that's being a good neighbor. That's loving your neighbor. Just asking them questions about what you believe. But as you're listening, you're listening also to say, okay, God, how can you help me just, just put a little stone in their shoe? Help them maybe not be as comfortable in their skepticism today. And with all this, the last thing, and this is the shortest, to have your witness endure, make sure your life matches your, your teaching. The worst thing that's out there is you have all these Christians with great answers, and then when you zoom back, you see their lives, and you wonder, that person can't believe anything they say. There's the old story about this woman who was pulled over by the police because she was cutting off cars and honking and swearing, and the policeman pulled her over. And he says, you know, draws his gun, get out of the car, put your hands on the roof. She's like, how's this speeding? Why are you doing all this? This must be a stolen car. She says, why would you assume that? Well, all your bumper stickers say, I love Jesus, follow me to Sunday school. And the way you are swearing and driving, there's no way you're a Christian. So I had to assume you stole this thing. That's a big example, but that's what we have to do. Is like, if people actually zoom back and, like, let's say you mentioned something about Jesus in a business meeting. I was on a big work call and just referenced, like, we're dealing with rules of engagement. I'm like, hey, we're shifting from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's all I said about it, but just kind of a, you know, a, hey, I'm a Christian type shot. So maybe people down the road, just that one little nudge. That's all I said about it. Somebody brought it up later. Just like, hey, I really respected that you even put that out there. Like, I'm not, but what if I do that, and then the next business call, I'm like, listen, you bleep and you bleep, how could you be late on that assignment? Click. Now, if you have a calm personality that people, you can, people know that they care about that, you can say something like that, and they might want to follow up. If you say that, and then you're this, can I say jerk in church? You're that sort of person. Then they're just going to think, oh, got another Christian hypocrite, and you've pushed them further. So St. Francis is quoted of saying, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Two things about that. One, he never said it. He preached with words often, a couple times a day. The gospel needs words. But what he actually said was to the brothers he was teaching to preach, that when you preach, make sure that you set your heart so on fire that you live it so that your words don't come out as cold and unfeeling. So make sure you live what you preach. And then your witness can endure. So this is Palm Sunday. And what I want you to picture is who in your life is crying Hosanna right now, which means rescue, save us. Who needs Jesus? You can't save them. Only God saves people. The Bible is very clear that Jesus draws people to him. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them. So you're not going to convince or argue anybody into the kingdom of God. But what you can do is pause and pray for them. You can ask them questions. You can be a great neighbor to them. And then see what God chooses to do. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you would call us. 
that you would put our fears to rest, that you'd help us to know that no matter what this world throws against us, that you still have us. And so, Father, I pray that those in our lives who don't know you, we'd be brave. Lord, that you give us that plan to just give them a little shove, that you'd give us knowledge about who you are, and there's so much available out there. But then, Lord, you'd give us the courage, the courage to speak about the hope that we have, the courage to talk about you. And we pray this in your blessed name. Amen. For our closing song, we're going to sing, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. And if you're able, please stand.